What we're going to do now is we're going to use the Interacoustics Eclipse equipment to actually do a CVAMP and an OVAMP and you'll be able to see the test in action, electrode uh, placement and everything else. This is the electrode montage for the CVAMP. Notice that I have the two reference uh, electrodes and sometimes they're called the inverting electrodes, sometimes they're just labeled minus uh, versus positive. Uh, anyway, they're on my sternocleidomastoid muscle. And you can see when I contract this by turning my head and trying to touch my shoulder with my chin as this muscle contracts that it begins at the earlobe and goes all the way down to the clavicle here, right? And uh, the ideal place on most people, you want the most, the meatiest, biggest part of this muscle, but on most people, if you look at this, there's a, like an upper third, a middle third, and a lower third. Well, right smack in the middle of the upper third is usually the ideal place that is going to give you the most amplitude. It is also important, not only that you get it right smack on the middle of the meatiest place of, on the SCM, but that you also are symmetrical from right to left. You don't have one down and one up or anything like this. So you, you, you're looking at the patient this way and make sure that everything is symmetrical, equal on each side. And then we have uh, the, um, the, in this case it's the white electrode, but this would be the positive electrode or the non-inverting electrode, or sometimes called the active electrode, uh, on the high forehead. And we have the ground on the low forehead. And that montage works perfectly. Uh, we are making sure that we got good impedance like all electrophys testing. Uh, so we're doing two things. We're not just, uh, we're not just using um, alcohol wipes and degreasing the skin, but we are also abrading the skin. The abrasion is very, very important. Uh, and as you can see here, this is the impedance test on the interacoustics eclipse. And there's a button right on the preamp and you can push that and you have uh, an LED light for each electrode, each of the four of them. It's either red or green. Green means that it is at least as low or lower than the dial setting. So ideally for all electrophys testing, we put the dial at three, means 3K. So that means that the impedance is either 3K or less. Uh, and that would be recommended. If I were to go any higher, I'd go to five, and some people even go to 10, uh, but, but three is what's recommended. The better the impedance is, the better the response is, the better the, uh, uh, the signal to noise ratio is, the better the common mode rejection is, just better for everything. Uh, so, so, the, so that's something that we should uh, be always concerned with. Anyway, so this is the correct montage for the, uh, this, the CVIMP test. So here you see the patient lying supine and when the stimulus starts the patient raised their head um, and it's best to have them be able to see their feet and then turn 90 degrees away from the stimulus and um, I always say try to touch your chin to your shoulder and as you can see the response is acquiring on the right, nice strong response and the total test was just a hundred stimuli so it didn't take it didn't take that long it was just a few seconds and we're going to do a, another one to see if it replicates because if it doesn't replicate you must investigate there I am up and over as soon as the stimulus starts and we're merging the two so that they're superimposed to make sure that we have two good and equal replicable runs. And we do. So that's it for the left side. We've collected CVAMP responses on both sides, right and left. And uh, we also did replications to make sure that we had a valid physiological response. And I like the replications to be similar to the original. So I'm moving this so that it's superimposed to make sure that that's similar. If I see a big difference, then I know there is a variance 
there's some inconsistency in the patient's effort when he's contracting his sternocleidomastoid muscle. But that looks fine to me, so I'll just choose which one I want to use. Uh, maybe I'll use this one, it's just a hair bigger. Um, I could add them together and use the addition if I want. Some people do that. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna use the bottom two. They, they, they replicated very nicely um, and they look like great responses and I'll mark them. Here's how I mark them. Uh, I'm gonna go over and get P1 and, uh, and I'm marking this left one here now because I've, it's active. You double click on the handle or the tag to make it active. And then I'll go over and get N1 and mark the trough. So it's the peak and trough, like that. I'll go over to the right response, double click on the handle to make it active, go get P1 and mark the peak, get N1 and mark the trough. And <clears throat> now I can see for, for the right side, for example, I can see my my latencies, P1 occurred at 15 milliseconds, N1 occurred at 24 milliseconds, and my overall amplitude, my amplitude was 300 microvolts. Pretty nice big response. Um, and, uh, and if I wanna look at all of that information on the, um, on the other one, on my left one that I'm double clicking on that tag and I can see my latencies, 15, uh, P1 is 15.6 uh, milliseconds, N1 is 23.6 milliseconds, and the amplitude on the left side is a little bit higher even, it's 325 microvolts, okay? Now, uh, if I want to know my, my um, my asymmetry ratio and have the uh, equipment uh, calculate f that for me so I don't have to do the math, then I just make sure that they are married and the way I marry them is make one active, uh, go over to the other one that I wanna marry to it uh, and just right click on the handle and say set as vent partner and then it will automatically calculate the asymmetry ratio, and in this case, here it is, 0 0.04. <clears throat> so, uh, as you can remember, the uh, abnormal is when you have an asymmetry ratio that exceeds 0.35, so this is well within the range of normal. <clears throat> One last thing you might want to consider. If there was a, a problem with the patient's effort in, this, in the CVAMP, where they may have used more effort when they were contracting the sternocleidomastoid muscle on one side versus the other. You can eliminate the effect by doing EMG scaling. <clears throat> and that's pretty easy to do. Um, I can look and show my EMG graph here. And this shows uh, if there is a difference in the effort. In this case, there, there wasn't much difference in the effort, but if there was, then I certainly can eliminate that difference by doing what we call EMG scaling. It takes that out. What we see is just a pure response. Uh, ear in, not connected to the amount of contraction. And so we made one of our two that are married together. We Naturally, we have that active. We're going to right click on the waveform of the other one and we're gonna say EMG scaling. We're gonna turn the EMG scaling on. So this just applied the EMG scaling to this, eliminating the effect of the um, effort of the patient, one direction versus the other. And now we have uh, a little bit of a change, not much change because my effort was um, very close to the same on both sides, but instead of having a 0.04 for an asymmetry ratio, now we have a 0.06. Makes no difference in this case, but it certainly could make a difference uh, if the patient was um, maybe contracting their sternocleidomastoid muscle on one side uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a way that was uh, 
more powerful than the way that they did it on the other side and giving you a false asymmetry ratio. You can eliminate that, that prospect. Remember also that you have the EMG monitor drawing the contraction of the muscles so you'll be able to know. You can see it and the patient can see it and you'll can uh, another way of ensuring that the contraction is equal one side to the others. And in the um, Interacoustics Eclipse product, you don't have to put on extra electrodes for EMG monitor or anything like that. It uses the reference electrodes that are, are already on there. So now hopefully you know uh, the anatomy involved, the pathology that could affect this response. Um, you know how to um, uh, collect the response, you know the electrode montage, you know the patient positions, all of these things um, that, that um, uh, affect the response and, and you know how to uh, mark it and, and analyze it. So this is the electrode montage for the OVAMP, the ocular VAMP. And there's a couple of things to note about this. First of all, notice the position of the two reference electrodes. Notice that the electrodes have been cut so that we could get the recording portion of the electrode as close to the eye as possible. And it's under the eyes, but it's not directly in the center. It is offset to the outside, halfway between center and the edge of the eye here. Okay. Why is that? Is because that position gives you the maximum amplitude. That's very important. Uh, another thing that is important is this, remember, is a contralateral response, unlike the CVAMP. And so we have actually reversed the two uh, reference or minus inverting electrodes. We've reversed them left and right because we want to actually measure a contralateral response, okay? Uh, and uh, my forehead's a little bit different too because this time my, my um, active electrode or my non-inverting electrode, my positive electrode is on the low forehead, almost on the bridge of the nose, and the ground is on the high forehead. Just a little bit different electrode montage, but this is foolproof and you end up with a perfect OVAMP from it. Remember that the patient has to look up during this test uh, and their gaze upward would be continuous as long as the stimulus is present and it would be at least 40 degrees from center. Uh, I make sure they're actually looking at the ceiling and you can put a 40 degree target if you want as well. Okay, so now that you know that, we're going to actually do the recording. This is the setup for the left ear. Here we are with the OVAMP test. As soon as the stimulus started, a patient was told to uh, look up, and that should be at least 40 degrees. I like to put a center target for them to look up and then have them look and watch the ceiling the whole time. That's to move the oblique ocular muscle as close to the electrode as possible. And there you see the response on the right. It's just two, 200 stimuli. And so, again, it only takes a few seconds to do this. Then we always run a repeat. Here we are running the repeat. Patient is told to look up as soon as the stimulus starts and to hold their gaze on the ceiling, um, 40 degrees or more. And our uh, second response is acquiring now. Again, just 200 stimuli, just a few seconds. And we like these to replicate. If there is a significant difference between the two, then I maybe do it a third time uh, because maybe the patient did not keep their eyes uh, uh, elevated or something like that. But these replicated just fine, so we're going to accept both runs. Okay, so now we have recorded an OVEMP response from left and right. In fact, we did a replication of each one, as you can see. And we always do a replication so that uh, we're assured that we do have a valid physiological response. And I also like to see that there isn't much difference between 
the first one and the second one on the same side. This way the patient, it ensures me that the patient used the same amount of effort. In the case of an OVIMP, the only effort is looking up, but they certainly have to do that uh, correctly and consistently during the test. And since there is no appreciable difference between these, uh, I can select the two that I'd like. In this case, I'm going to use the lower two, and I can mark them. I'll do the right one first and double click on the tag in order to uh, make it active and then select N1 and go ahead and mark it at the leading trough right there. And then I can go and select P1 and mark it at the peak right there. So I can see over here, I can see my, um, my latencies, N1 was at 13.6 milliseconds and P1 was at 19 milliseconds. That's within what I expect, so uh, I have a good valid response. And it happens to be uh, 3.2 microvolts. That's by amplitude. And that's about the amplitudes that you're used to measuring in ABRs and, and ECOGs. Uh, this is a lot lower amplitude than the CVAMP, which is gigantic, so that's why we had to raise the gain when we did this test. So now we'll look at the left. I'll double click on that tag in order to make it active, and I'll go get N1 and mark it in the leading trough, and then P1 and mark the peak. And once I do that, I can tell you some things, like I can tell you uh, that N1 occurred at 12.6 milliseconds, P1 occurred at 17 milliseconds, I like that, and that the amplitude is a little bit larger than my right side, it's 4.28, 4.28. So now I want to know what the asymmetry difference is. That's the big thing, asymmetry difference between these amplitudes left and right. So I have my left one active, uh, I had double clicked on the tag. So I'm going to now uh, click on the tag of the right one and say set as vent partner. Once I do, then the software knows that these are the two that I want to use to calculate the asymmetry ratio and it will do it for me. And it is 0.14. Well, within normal, because you'll remember that an abnormal asymmetry ratio is something that exceeds 0.35. So I hope that that is helpful and that, um, that you have now an overview of these two tests and the anatomical structures involved and the type of pathology that can, be, uh, uh, that, that can cause this response to be abnormal.